Awesome. Right on, David. Thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight with our Street Life Ministries uh, Facebook Live podcast, where we get to hear um, beautiful testimonies and stories about uh, people's lives who have taken some interesting twists and turns, and um, and God has been on, on the road the whole way and, and has been part of your journey, a part of all of the folks that have shared with us as part of the journey. And uh, so if you don't mind, I'm just going to open us up in prayer, and then we'll go ahead and uh, get started, okay? So, right, Lord, yeah. Father, we just come to you right now and just want to say thank you so much for uh, David's uh, testimony, Lord, and his uh, heart, God, and what you have done in and through his life, Lord. We just pray that anyone who watches this uh, tonight or in the future, Lord, can hear um, just the sincerity in his heart, can hear the truth in, in his testimony, Lord, and um, in his road uh, from where he was, uh, what happened, and where he is today, and just see how you have been um, in ultimate control of everything in, in his life, Lord, as you've walked him through a, just an unbelievable journey, a journey which he never thought would happen, but yet at the, at the end of all of this, you are uh, in control, and you are doing some marvelous work in this uh, man's life, Lord. So we just come to you right now, Lord, and just pray for the ears that will hear this and the eyes that will see this testimony uh, to be blessed and glorified. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Awesome. So, David, I met you probably, what, a, about a year and a half ago? Yeah, yeah, just about a year and a half ago. Yeah. So you came to the ministry uh, saying, hey, I need to do a little uh, community service work. <laughs> and you kind of shared a little bit about uh, about your story with me. And I would say that maybe about a week after you shared your testimony with me, I, Vicky and I were reading in, so I don't know exactly where I was reading. And all of a sudden, your whole story was just in the in the front newspaper. And I was like, holy cow, man. This guy has got a story. Yeah, I just, I, I'm fascinated by your story. I There was another gentleman uh, who also uh, was a member of uh, a local police off, a police station, and he had an incredible testimony uh, like yours. Um, and, and just his whole journey to recovery, his whole journey to what he's doing today, uh, it's just fascinating to me because I think... Um, and I'm speaking for myself, but I think I'm speaking for others. I think when we see the uniform, we see the badge, we forget that there's a human being behind that. And we kind of look at you guys as kind of like heroes. We look at you guys as kind of like invincible. And we forget that the stress that you're under and the circumstances that you go through in your life is no different than the rest of us. And you're just as human as the rest of us. And so when I hear testimonies like yours, it, and I can't wait for everybody to hear your story be shared, I just am just blown away because I hope that there's other men and women that are going through somewhat of your same uh, uh, background, maybe will hear this and they will reach out and they will be amazed by the fact that they can, you know, uh, reach out before it gets too far gone. And so uh, with that, I mean, just, yeah, man, just go ahead and just share your heart, bro. I just, I did to share with everybody your story and, and, and I, yeah, go ahead, man. Ah, thank you. Well, thank you again for having me on the show. Well, Pastor David, it, um, yeah, I grew up in San Francisco, um, it, uh, wanted to be a police officer from the youngest age, just like my older brother. And we both had a desire to go into law enforcement. He, he's a few years older. He got in the sheriff's department in San Francisco. I joined shortly after. I was there for about four years, uh, but I really wanted to work the, the streets because San Francisco is just one city, one county. So the sheriff doesn't, they don't patrol anywhere. <clears throat> so I waited, applied to the police department, got in. And so I did a total of 33 years in law enforcement, 29 with the police and four with the sheriffs. Had a really good career. Um, I wish it was a little less eventful. Uh, right off the bat, you know, I'm on probation and uh, we're out looking for what we call Prolium, which is PAL, who's wanted for a couple robberies. He'd been spotted a few times and car chases ensued, but they had to be canceled because they're getting too reckless. My partner and I, we spot him and uh, chases on a little bit later at night. 
Um, so it wasn't as, as dangerous of a pursuit, at least when it came to the other citizens. Uh, pursuit lasted about 15 minutes until we ended up in this big parking lot where he spun out of control. My thought process, my experience was he was going to jump out of his car and run on foot. So I got out of my car, opened my car door, thinking he was going to run. Instead, he drove his car right into me and crashed into me, pinned me between my police car, uh, backed up, uh, drove at me again, hit me a second time. Shots are being fired. Um, he eventually escapes. Uh, he was in a 5.0 Mustang. Uh, we tried to reinitiate the pursuit, but he got away. Uh, you know, God, God has been looking out for me. Um, we joke when we say God looks out for fools and cops, and, and I am, I'm kind of both sometimes. And, uh, you know, I walked away. Yeah, I walked away with that with just a minor bruising, no serious injuries. You know, in an incident like that, you know, you would think it would have an effect on you. But, you know, I thought, yeah, you know, I'm a tough guy. It was no big deal. I'm alive. I'm okay. Fast forward about two years, my partner and I are walking into a park in the city where they'd had a gang shooting the week before. Uh, a bunch of gang members in there. They see us coming. They start yelling 5 which is their street lingo for police. Uh, we're in plain clothes, but we we're obviously, they knew who we were. We had our badges out, flashlights, and we start to chase them. And as we come around the corner, there's a guy waiting there with a shotgun. And I didn't see him at first. My partner saw him. Fires the shotgun. Again, glory to God. He missed somehow <laughs> from less than 10 yards away. Um, again, you know, I just like, okay, that happened. I'm alive. It's okay. And I say these things not that, you know, I was some super cop out on the street, but these are major incidents. You know, these are, these are traumatic incidents in, in people's lives and especially in first responders. It takes a toll on you and you think it doesn't. You know, I know. Most of the first responders, most of the police and firefighters and EMTs that I work with, you know, they see gruesome things. They deal with victims of violent crimes. And we just think, you know, we're okay it, until you're not. Um, but I thought I was doing well. You know, it, it's, it's San Francisco. It was busy. I dealt with a lot of homicides. Um, I started in the mid-90s when the, we say the crack wars were going on. And gang violence was at its peak. Yeah. And so, you know, you witness a lot of stuff. but. You know, you, you learn early on that you have to suck it up, Buttercup. That's kind of the the phrase you hear around the station. You know, you're not supposed to let your emotions come out. You're not supposed to let it bother you. It's just, it's part of the job. If you can't handle it, kid, you need a new job is what the old timers would tell you. Mm-hmm. Uh, eventually, um, yeah, the faulty logic, I'll tell you that. But, but at the time, you're a young rookie. You're like, oh, okay, I guess that's how it's supposed to be. So, all right, I'm good. Um, eventually, I got in our canine unit. That was something I'd always wanted to do. Um, after five years in the unit, I was able to, um, unfortunately, we lost our sergeant, who was the trainer. We lost him to a massive heart attack, um, which is not uncommon in law enforcement. Uh, he was only 42 years old. Uh, it is still considered an on-duty injury because of the, the stress and the toll it takes on our bodies that heart attacks are automatically considered uh, in the light of duty death. Uh, when he passed away, me and another officer, we took over the training, the dog unit. And during that uh, period where I was a trainer for the next 10 years, we were doing a scenario where I got bit pretty bad by one of the dogs, left a good, about a golf ball sized chunk of my leg missing out of my calf. And so at the time, what they thought was going to be permanent nerve damage. So this was back when they gave out Vicodin and Norco and all the opioids, you know, like with Pez candy. You know, as long as you were in pain, they kept refilling it for you. And, and there was pain. I mean, my, my leg hurt. I, I had a hard time doing a lot of things. It was difficult sometimes at work because I obviously can't take drugs at work. So I had this eight-hour window before work where I couldn't take anything. And most days I could get through the shift and other days I'd have to go home early. Um, but, you know, I, I was getting by and I was, I was learning to work through the pain. And sometimes Motrin would be enough to kind of ease it till I got off duty. Um, about three years into it, I had a really good pain manager. I was going down to Stanford Hospital, and they got me into a surgeon who was able to go in there and fix the nerve damage, which yeah. at the time knocked off about, well, what I thought at the time, about 90% of the pain. So I was ecstatic. I mean, I, you know, chronic pain is horrible. I don't wish that upon anybody. And I don't think opioids should be completely taken off, off of the counter for people. 
but there definitely needs to be better supervision of those who are taking it. You know, I need it for those three years. I absolutely need it. And it definitely helped. And it made my life more bearable. The problem was once they fixed the damage and the pain went away, yeah. my pain manager started to wean me off the opioids. And right as I was getting down to from a max of 10 a day down to one a day, I started to realize I, I missed it. I missed the feeling that the opioids gave me. It made me feel happy. Now, that's how I thought of them, my happy pill. You know, they, they kept me from being sad, or stressed out, or bothered by the things I saw at work. And right, that was the same time that my workers' comp case was closed out, and I was transferred back to my family doctor. And so when I transferred back to him, and he asked me how my leg was, I said, "Oh no, it still bothers me. I'm still in a lot of pain." He's like, "Oh okay," and he just refilled the script back to ten a day because that's what I was at. And as far as he knew, that's what I needed. And so that continued uh, for a good eleven years. About. Three, four years into it, I started adding alcohol to it because the pills weren't enough. And, you know, I thought I was maintaining. I thought, well, you know, I'm not going up on the prescription. I'm not asking for more. I mean, I was not making it to the end of the prescription. And the laws were a lot looser then. So, you know, I could get a 30-day supply and I could refill it after 20 days. So I went through a 30 days in 20. No problem. I just get a refill, go to the hospital, go to the pharmacy and get my refill. Well, as the, as the law started to change, they started tightening grip on the prescriptions. It came to, you could only get it five days, three days. And then eventually it came down to, you could only get it the day before your refill was due. So on the 29th day. And that's when I was really having a hard time. You know, I'd gotten pretty, you know, like most addicts, you know, you, you come up with creative ways to find drugs. I, I was a police officer. I didn't use drugs at work. I wasn't going to go buy them off of the street, but you know, Mom always had some. Somebody in my family always had their pills that they didn't want because it made them nauseous. There was always someone willing to give you their pills that they didn't want. But, you know, as that got harder and harder and I struggled more, the depression really kicked in. I mean, I, I, I knew I was addicted. I knew I was full-on addicted to pills. I knew I was full-on addicted to the alcohol. You know, I tried to kick the alcohol. I kept telling myself, you know, if, if you kick the alcohol, that's going to be good. And then you could kick the pills. You know, let's just do it one step at a time. And, you know, the most I made it off alcohol was 30 days. And that was once. So other than that, I never made it more than three or four days. And so I came to the realization that I was never going to be able to do this on my own. And I sure. couldn't ask for help. I, I just, you know, it's, it's both the addict mind. It's the kind of person I grew up. I, you know, I, I grew up in a childhood where, unfortunately, my mom was a single mom. And she worked nights. And from the age of 12 on, I was a latchkey kid. You know, I came home to an empty house. My mom didn't get home till four in the morning. She was asleep when I went to school. When I came home, she was gone. And that's kind of how I raised myself. I learned that only I can help myself. And I don't ask others for help because there's nobody else there. My dad was absent. He was never around. My brothers had moved out down to the other side of the state. Um, and then just first responders. I mean, you see it in other other professions but you see it a lot first responders in the military where you know we feel like we're we're the ones that people come to for help we're, that's why we go into these jobs because we want to help people we shouldn't have to ask others for help it, you, you feel like you're weak like you're not you're not being the pillar that you're supposed to be the sign of strength and, and as you said earlier you know the hero that comes in and helps someone who's in distress and so despite the fact that my police department had probably one of the best employee assistance programs out there. I mean, they set the industry standards for what it should look like for first responders. I could have called any time to ask for help and they would have taken me to a detox, no questions asked, no repercussions from my agency, no fear of being demoted or fired, or suspended. Right. They just want to know if you ask for help on your own, they're going to support you. And as long as you come back clean and sober and stay that way, they're going to support you. Um, but I didn't ask for the help. and. In November of 2022, about two months before that, the depression was bad. It was, I was getting to the point where I was starting to really think about my own suicide. I, I had, I have a family, I have a wife and two daughters, and that kept me from wanting, wanting to hurt myself. But the drinking was convincing me otherwise. I would get so drunk at night. I would just think about going out of the house. And I didn't want them to know it was suicide. 
So, you know, my thought was, you know, I'll just go, I'll go down to uh, Pacifica and drive off the Devil's Slide. For the viewers who don't know, it's a road, unfortunately, where people have accidents and you don't really survive because it's a 300 foot drop. And, you know, that was my thought process. I'll just, I'll, I'll make it look like an accident and no one will know the wiser. But I wouldn't do it. You know, I would think about the harm it would cause my family. I know statistically children of parents who commit suicide are more likely to commit suicide. Um, but it it gotten that bad. And so, you know, on that November day, I went to work. Uh, I took off work early. Went to go take my mom out for lunch. I thought my mom would be able to give me some of her pain meds. Tied me over because I was down to one pill. But I was 10 days away from a refill. But I was supposed to be leaving town on a destiny wedding for a family uh, member. We were supposed to be flying down to Mexico in two days. And my mom didn't have any. I didn't know where else I could get any. And I realized that in about two or three days, the really bad part of the withdrawal kicks in, I was going to be on a plane to Mexico. And that addictive mind just takes over. And I could think of nothing else. But I thought, you know, I'll go rob a pharmacy. You know, no one will get hurt. I'm not going to harm anybody. I'll just give them a note, tell them to give me some Norco. And then I told myself, but I'm going to get help after this. This is, your, this is so bad. You're going to do this. But this will tide you over. You get back from this vacation, you're going to go ask for help. Because you got you to get clean. But I also told myself, if the police show up, I'm going to shoot myself in the head really quick. I'm not going to jail. I'm not doing this to my family. Um, went in there, handed the note. And, you know, looking back, talking to my counselors and my therapist, you know, that was an absolute cry for help. It was the worst plan robbery in the world. Um, no real escape route. I sat there. I watched the pharmacist call 911. I watched her give my description out on the phone. I could have left at that point. I wouldn't have had any pills, but I wouldn't have gotten arrested. But I, I stood there. And they gave me the pills. They gave me a bag full of bottles. I walked out of the pharmacy, and there was the police department waiting for me. And the next thing you know, I'm in handcuffs in the back of a police car. And I'm thinking, my life is over. I'm done. I've just took a 33 year career that was at its peak I was, I was the acting lieutenant in the last three years in charge of our homeless outreach unit a little irony there was i was in charge of our drug diversion program i was in charge of a program set up to divert people out of the criminal justice system and into detox and rehabilitation service and yet i couldn't help myself i could go out there and talk to these people who are homeless that have much more severe drug addiction than me and talk them into this program and tell them how important it was to get sober, and how important it was for their life to, to turn around. And I couldn't even tell myself that. So I get booked into jail. You know, I get bailed out by my wife. I have to tell her and my daughters what happened. Go to detox for 30 days. Uh, again, God has just consistently looked out for me through this whole process. I was allowed to retire. I wasn't fired. They didn't try to go after my pension. Um, they understood what it was. They understood that it was an addiction. They knew my career. They knew who I was. They knew that wasn't me. And they were willing to allow me to retire. So I retired. I spent the, the following year just relapsing on the alcohol. Because I didn't know what was going to happen with my case. Um, there was a very real possibility of prison time. And that was hard to deal with. But I was going to end up in prison. I deserved it. I knew what I did was wrong. I, I don't think I, I never felt that I didn't deserve it. But just that thought process that I was going to end up in prison made me relapse on alcohol several times. Eventually got off of that. Did get sentenced to jail. Um, I was granted three years probation, but a year in the county jail, of which I had to do six months. Got out on Father's Day of last year. Um, and if you remember, right before I went in, I had bought, started volunteering with your organization um, because of what you did. We, we have a mutual friend. He's the one that had me reach out to you. I like, you know, what you're doing at your ministry. And, you know, I was very upfront with you. So you knew that I was going to be a short term volunteer. Uh, but as soon as I came out, you know, I reached out to you again. I was like, hey, I'm ready. I want to come back and volunteer. So, you know, I've been clean and sober off of the opioids for 15 months. I wish I could say it was the same for the alcohol, but the alcohol is coming up on five months. And uh, man, God has been a blessing to me. 
And right now I spend the majority of my time um, telling my story, you know, appearing on podcasts like this, uh, going to police departments and fire departments uh, around the country and telling them my story as a word of caution that this is a very real thing. And it's not just in first responders, but, you know, because that's my expertise, that's where my talks are geared that, you know, you can ask for help. You don't have to hit rock bottom. You don't have to wait till you have nowhere else to go. That help is out there when you could seek it and you should seek it. And that's just my consistent message. And that's, that's been my new mission in life. This, I believe that things do happen for a reason. You just have to understand what God was giving you, what path he has, has you on. Don't try to create your path against what God has created. And this is what God has wanted me to do. And, and that's, that's my personal ministry right now, is to save as many first responders as I can from addiction. The story. Wow. That's... That is one heck of a story, man. I, I, man, I just, I love the way you share it. Is it, is it, um, is it possible you can plug what you do today? Uh, if you want, you can plug it. And then if you want to send me a link to it, I can, I can put the link in here if any, uh, anybody wants to get a hold of you. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. So, um, in the interim, um, you know, I was trying to decide what I was going to do with my life. You know, I'm only 58. I still wanted to work. My, my plan had been I was going to retire from the San Francisco Police Department. You leave as a lieutenant or a captain from my department. You could go to a smaller agency and come in as a, a chief or an assistant chief because the amount of experience we would get compared to a department of maybe 100 officers. You know, it's kind of hard to go back into police work when you have a felony conviction and you're currently on felony probation. Uh, plus, any other type of security roles, security manager jobs, those are all now out of the question. I wasn't sure what I was going to do with my life. And just through a mutual connection, uh, I, I met Ron, and he's the CEO of Hire, and they had created, it's a small Silicon Valley company startup, and they created a personality assessment to use this predictive analytics and AI, and it was originally designed for the hiring of CEOs, CFOs, top executives. We could also put together a cultural DNA so we could take a division and see where their strengths and weaknesses are. Um, but he had met another uh, retired chief out of Texas and told him how we use these assessments to hire police officers to make sure they're mentally fit and how the same assessment can be used on a regular basis to continuously monitor the mental health of first responders. And so that's, that's when Ron met me. Uh, he heard my story. He, was, he wanted to hire me, right? He's like, your story, I think this will be right up your alley once he explained what they do, I realized this is a need in, in the first responder community. You know, to give an assessment once at hiring is great, but we know already, there's already been scientific studies that show there's a physical change to the brain of first responders. On, on average, the average citizen may be exposed to three, maybe four traumatic incidents in their life. Uh, first responders average three to five a month throughout a 30-year career on average. So we're, we're, so we're talking well over 150 traumatic incidents. We don't, we don't monitor them. We know PTSD is about 58% in first responders. Alcoholism and substance abuse is about 40%. Both are way higher than the general public. And so with this tool and, and the way I approach the, the first responder community, the leaders, the chiefs, the fire chiefs is that you know, you need to monitor your, your members on a regular basis because this is an early intervention tool. This is a way to get in there and go, hey, something has changed. What is going on with you? Because we know the first responders are going to have a hard time for asking for help. But if they can see it, they could see the change. They could see what's showing on this, on this assessment. Right? It makes it easier for them to open up about it. It opens up that door for a conversation to get them into their peer support program, to get them into therapy, to get them the help that they need. Because the way what we have set up now is, is it's not working. And so we need to go a new way. We have this technology and we're lucky here in the Silicon Valley area to have this technology available. So yeah, the, uh, where I work, the, it's higher. You can find us at thehire.net and you can reach me at davin, D-A-V-I-N, at thehire.net. 
And if you want to have me come out and speak, and I don't speak to just first responders, I'll come out and speak at any event. Uh, you can reach me just at contact David Cole, that's D A V I N C O L E, one whole word, contact David Cole at gmail.com. And I'm more than happy to come out and talk to any group, but especially my first responder community. Let me know and I will come out and talk to you. Yeah, that's powerful. You know, um, I know that uh, I know that Redwood City Police Department and I think uh, the San Mateo County Sheriff's Office um, are doing uh, uh, life scans. You know, the the body scan because mm -hmm. of the um, because of all the stress that goes on. I guess there's 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 a, a machine that they can use that scans the body that let them know like where the heart is and, you know, and all that stuff because of all this, I guess, because of all the trauma and the, all the stress, the, you know, the ups and downs uh, that create, you know, a lot of um, the undue stress or whatever. I, I don't know what the, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm not a doctor, so I don't know the medical terminology for it, but I just know that a lot of you guys uh, are dealing with a lot more stress than the average person, which again goes into the alcoholism and I'm sure the high divorce rate and the suicide and, you know, and, and, you know, the list I'm sure is, is quite long. Um, yeah. You know, so um, as we kind of wrap things up, David, you know, is there any, is there anything out of your experience that you went through that you could share with anybody who may be listening to this, whether they're a, a police officer, fire department, or just anybody uh, that might be listening to this, that, um, thinking that they could handle it on their own and I'll just, they just, they could just manage this and it'll go away eventually. I mean, I'm sure that's what you told yourself many times and you yeah. know, you see what, what happens. So I don't know if you have any like kind of thoughts that you could share with that or not. No, I mean, I mean, you said it, this is not something you could do on your own. It is a rare person that is able to get out of addiction on their own. You need to have a support team there. You need to put together both medical team, therapist, a sobering coach, or a sponsor at AA, whichever program you go into. But you need to have a team. And when you go ask for help, you have to ask for help. You have to be willing. You have to be vulnerable. You have to be willing to accept that you're in a place that you're going to have to rely on others initially to get you going. And there's nothing wrong with that. We're not meant to be alone. We're not solo creatures. We're social creatures. We've always functioned within a social network. That's how we've survived for millennia. And this is how you will survive. My other message is it does get better. I, I, I remember going through all these courses through my police department. We talk about, you know, getting clean, going to detox, and getting a program. But I think what they missed the mark on is showing people how great it looks to be sober, how it feels, how excited you are, the, just the overall change in your life from being sober to being a new person. That's the other thing I learned. I used to say, I want to go back to the guy I used to be. No, because the guy I used to be ended up being addicted. No, I'm a <laughs> new person. Now. I had to, right? I, I, had to, I had to accept that I have to be a new person. You know, and there's going to be some changes and that's okay. But this, it gets better. No matter where you hit, no matter how hard you fall, no matter where you end up, God is going to lift you back up and it will get better. It may not be the way you think it's going to be. It may not come as easy as you hope it will, but it'll come. Have faith and go with it and look forward to it and drive yourself to your sobriety. That, that to me has been the biggest key for the last several months of my recovery. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I, you know, I, I do want to ask you uh, just one thing, because I know, so for a police officer who, you know, obviously is very noticeable, even off duty, most criminals can recognize a police officer. So <laughs> if, if a police officer is say dealing with alcohol or drug addiction and they want to go to an AA or NA meeting, um, but they're like, Hey, I'm going to get noticed. If I go in there, there might be somebody in there that I gave a D arrested for DUI or something. Is there something that's available for, for law enforcement or even fire department that may be it living in the local community that want to stay, uh, and, uh, you know, anonymous 
as the program is anonymous, but let's just mm-hmm. face it, you know, there's humans are humans, right? So yeah. is there is there an outlet for folks like that? So there are several first responder only AA meetings. You won't find them in the general AA directory. Uh, some of it's by word of mouth. If anybody wants to reach out to me at that email at contact Dave and Cole, I can connect you with the AA group that I'm part of. Uh, it's all first responders. Uh, if you go on to, and I don't have the name, there's a couple on Facebook. And if you do a Google search, there's, a, there's two other ones that are first responders only. Um, they will vet you out and then uh, let you into the group. But I will tell you this, my experience. My experience has been going to AA meetings they don't care because yeah. they see you as one of them. You will go to these meetings and you will sit there and you'll, the first two or three you go to, you can sit there and you're going to be like, wow, that's, that's, that's my story. It may not be the same. It may not be a first responder. It may not be a guy married with a wife and two children, but it's still my story. This person, Oh, you hid your liquor bottles all over the house too. Oh, you would sneak out in the middle of the night and go, wow, I did all that stuff too. You start to realize that, they're just like you. You're just like them, and they're accepting. I've never been to an NA meeting. I have heard that might be a little bit different, um, but I still, I would say, go. You don't have to walk in there and go, hey, I'm a cop. Just lay low. You don't even have to talk at these meetings. You can sit in the back of the room, in the corner, and just listen. And if you're not comfortable, find another meeting. Because that's the thing with these AA and NA meetings. Not every meeting is for everyone. They all have different, slightly different formats, different groups. Find the one that you like. And if you're not into AA, there's Life Ring. There's other groups. Find what works for you. But don't be afraid because of the job that we have to not go into one of these groups and ask for help. Because you'll find they're super accepting. I mean, I, I've told my story a hundred times at non-law enforcement groups. And, and the love I get is amazing. They just like, I went to jail for six months. Everybody on my pod knew exactly who I was. And they knew my story. I just got a call from a guy today from CDC. He's like, Cole, I got sent. I got nine years. I wanted to check on you, brother. I want to make sure you're okay. I haven't talked wow. to you in a couple. You know, that's impactful to me. Like, I, 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 I can make no judgment. What he did is what he did. He's accepted his responsibility. But the fact that he, we, he didn't see me as a, as a cop, as an a-hole. As, he's like, hey, you were here with me. We shared some times together. We talked. And is it okay if I reach out to you from prison? I'm going to be here for nine years. I was like, absolutely. So don't don't let that be a hindrance to getting help or going to these meetings. That's cool. Thank you, Dave, David, for uh, sharing your testimony with us and being vulnerable and and sharing that. And and again, as I prayed in our opening, I I do pray that whoever watches this now and 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 whoever will go on our YouTube channel or or uh, look at our past uh, videos and. I really hope that they find a nugget um, in your testimony that will speak to them and and reach out to somebody and or and or if they know somebody who's struggling and say, you know what, you know, if this guy can do it, I can do it. You know, I mean, I I, I just I I love testimonies. That's one of my favorite parts about going to AA meetings is not not all the AA meetings I go to. um, Do I hear a story that's my story? But you always hear something within the story that's, you know, just really powerful. And you can see God's work involved in it. And um, and again, hearing your story, you know, just really reminds me of how vulnerable we are as humans, no matter where we are. And uh, and like you said, you know, here you are, you were actually in charge of a department that was going out and helping people that were dealing with stuff. And here you are wrestling with your own, your own demons. And it's just, I'm just so glad that yeah. God is so good and he was in the transforming business and um i'm grateful having you a part of our ministry and i'm grateful to see you when you come down there and you're you know obviously very relatable to a lot of people i know i know a lot of our folks our volunteers love having you come down and and being a part of our 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 little our little homeless ministry so very grateful that however you came on our radar you're here so um so thank you so much, uh, David, and I hope you have a blessed uh, rest of your walk out there and, and and enjoy yourself. And I look forward to seeing you. Are, when are you driving next? I, I will see you Monday evening. There we go. See you Monday evening. I'll see you then. Thank you, Pastor. All right. God bless. You too. Bye-bye.